What if the cost of your daughter's wedding was going to be your entire life savings? Would you think twice about having a daughter then? Would you condemn someone else for having, having the, made the same decision or thinking twice about having a daughter? I ask because there are 60 million women missing in India today. Missing women who should be in the population but simply aren't. Who should be there in India's population. Think about that number for a second. Think about how big that number is. 60 million is the entire population of the UK, the country where I'm from. That is the entire population of Gujarat. It is double the number of people who live in Punjab, where my parents are from. Where does that number come from? You would need an additional 37 million more Indian women just to equalize the number of women and men in India, according to the last census. You would need another 23 million so that India has a natural sex ratio like most of the world. In total, that's 60 million women. Where did these women come from? Where did these women go? Why are they missing? Now, of course, the fact that female feticides are aborted before they're even born is a big part of the problem, but that's not the whole story. 60 million women are missing because infants are murdered before, just after they're born. 60 million women are missing because children are neglected, young girls are neglected when they're growing up. In India, a girl under the age of five has 75% more chance of dying to a boy. That is the highest difference in the entire world. 60 million women are missing because in India, a large percentage of women die when they're giving birth. In fact, the rate is 220 per 100,000 women, five times that of China. 60 million women are missing because brides are murdered for their dowry, because women go destitute. What's worse is the problem is not getting better. This is the national sex ratio for children at the end of the age of six. As you can see from independence, that is consistently going down. The gap is widening between the number of boys and the number of girls. So let me ask you again. If the cost of your daughter's wedding was going to be your entire life savings, would you think twice about having a daughter then? What if you were worried about going bankrupt? Would you condemn someone else for making that decision? Now, you might think these are insensitive questions, but actually they're central to India's problem. I'm here today because I passionately believe that men of Indian origin need to speak out about the violence in our midst. We need to take responsibility. We need to talk about the mindset that perpetuates this violence. When I was growing up in Chennai as a teenager, the cleaner in our local area committed suicide because she could not bear the daily beatings from her drunk husband. We have all seen stories like this. I'm sure you have too. We've seen them on TV, we read about them in newspapers, and it infuriates all of us. What can we do about it? The point I'm trying to make today is that central to India's problem is the fact that girls are seen as a liability and boys are seen as a financial asset. This is very much an economic equation. That in families, they worry about the cost of bringing up girls because they think that's going to lose them money. And to change that depressing dynamic, we have to think about how women can become more financially empowered. Let's take the issue of dowry, for example, where a bride's family gives presents and money to the groom's family at the wedding, the hedge. It's outlawed, but still practiced widely in India. Over the last few decades, in fact, the price of dowry has gone up and up consistently. Why? Initially, that was because there are far more young people 
than old people in this country because of the demographics of India. So because women get married earlier, there have been far more women than men in the marriageable age. So what happens is that families of brides have been looking for more grooms, chasing them, trying to bid up dowries because they're looking for a suitable groom. That's unfortunately the way the market works, and so the price of dowries has been going up. Ironically, since the boom of the 80s, the sex selection boom of the 80s, in fact, that number has become more equalized, but not enough to reverse this trend. In fact, the price of dowry still keeps on going up. Why? That is partly because of status. As men have become more uh, uh, richer and more financially secure because of the financial reforms of the last 20, 30 years, they have started to compete on status. That means they've started to demand higher dowries to compete with other men on status. We read about lavish weddings in the newspapers. That encourages other people to want also have lavish weddings, so they demand higher dowries. Furthermore, what happens is that as they have started competing, they're also being influenced by foreign marketing and foreign um, advertising. So instead of a Maruti car, they want a big BMW. This is the problem today. The, dowry, the price of dowry has gone up. Inflation, dowry inflation. So in fact, things are getting worse and worse. This is a map of India looking at the child sex ratio for under the age of seven. The redder a state, the worse the problem is. There's three things to note about that map. Firstly, it's worse in urban areas than it is in rural areas. Secondly, it's worse in richer areas than it is in poorer areas. Delhi and Punjab, some of the most pro prosperous straight states in this country, way worse than states like Kerala in the south where there are more women than men. Thirdly, while the decline in urban areas is halted slightly, it's slowed down, in fact, in rural areas, it's accelerating. <clears throat> it's getting worse. Why? Because NGOs say that in certain areas, uh, hospitals and doctors now have an incentive to sell <clears throat> cheaper sex selection to rural families, to poorer families. They can afford them now. So they're going for the same uh, sex selection, going for abortion services that were previously used by the middle class. What is happening is that the gap between the number of men and women is getting wider and wider. Some estimate that in a few years' time, this country is going to have 20 million unmarried men of marriageable age. 20 million men going around unmarried in gangs. Men in gangs are more likely to get involved in drugs, more likely to get in involved in alcoholism and commit crime. And of course, they're more likely to commit violence against women. This is now an epidemic that is spreading across the country. And if we don't do something about it, it's going to get worse and worse. <clears throat> I'm going to give you an example of <clears throat> where things have changed. This is South Korea and China. From the 1950s all the way to the 1970s, South Korea and China were on a similar path. The gap between the number of boys <coughs> and girls was widening. But what's interesting is that from the 1990s, they took different paths. <coughs> While China got worse and worse, South Korea has got reversed back to the natural sex ratio. Why? Because in South Korea, women started getting jobs. Women started entering the labor force. They started marrying later on. They started um, being more financially independent. Whereas in China, because of the one-child policy, and because women don't work as much, the, same sex, the sex ratio is still getting worse. And what's interesting is that in both countries, women are very highly educated. And yet, in China, there's still a problem. Take another example. Huma and Mina are two women in their 30s. Ten years ago, Huma was forced into a marriage by her parents. And the man who 
she was forced to marry, assaulted her and raped her. And she went back to her parents and told them what happened. And they said, go back to the marriage. They abandoned her. She ran away from them. She ran away from her marriage. She's not seen them for 10 years. She's not seen her parents for 10 years. Mina was going to go into a marriage, got engaged, and then the groom's family started making demands for a dowry, started uh, saying things about things that she couldn't, she couldn't do after marriage. In the end, she broke it off. What's interesting to me is that these are not very common examples. Both of these women are from India, uh, from, from India originally, but now live in the UK have always grown and born and bred in the UK. While Indians from here, Punjabis and Gujaratis mainly, have gone over to the UK and retained a lot of their cultural attitudes and cultural traditions, dowry and forced marriages have almost entirely been wiped out in a generation. Why? Again, because women in the UK of Indian origin also go out and work. They have become started to marry later, they have become more financially independent, and they can come out of those situations. Huma now lives in London, has a nice job, has, a, has her own house. Mina was able to step away from that marriage, is married to someone else, but would, she, would her parents have allowed her to step away from the first marriage if they thought that she was, was going to be a financial drain on them? In the course of my research, I found several things. One is, I plotted all the sex ratios of Indian states with how educated women were in those states. And I found that there was no correlation. In places like Delhi, where women, there's 81% literacy rate for women, it's still one of the worst states in the country for the sex ratio. Secondly, inheritance matters a lot. What, when states across India changed their inheritance laws so that women were able to also inherit property like men, those women that were affected by those laws actually saw less violence in their family, less, so less violence generally in their communities. And thirdly, women who are financially independent who have jobs or have financial assets are less likely to face violence and more likely to flee any violent relationships. There are some government schemes too to try and help girls. In Delhi, the Lardley scheme tries to give parents, it gives parents 10,000 rupees when a girl is born and it gives them more money if they enro enroll her at school. And as she progresses up the school and she goes on to the next class, they get more money. And when she graduates from junior college, they get one lakh rupees. The point is to try and get the, encourage them and think that the girl does not, is not necessarily a financial liability for them. Now, it's difficult to judge how well these schemes have gone because, of course, the sex ratio gap has not become smaller, but the rate of decline has slowed down somewhat. Closer to home, I find another example. Geeta was a young girl who ran away from her house, uh, from her parents who lived in the slums, to an orphanage in Mumbai, called, run by a group called Asha Foundation. The Asha Foundation I find interesting because they not only take these orphanages and house them, but they've now started a scheme which is focused on giving them internships and training them up to work at companies, young girls <clears throat> from slums. And they're given regular classes, they're given regular training sessions, try and learn languages, try and learn skills so they can use them at an office. Gita wants to become an accountant, so they trained her up, and she's now doing work experience at an accountancy firm, and she's doing the kind of work that she wants to do. She's 18. The point that I'm trying to make, <clears throat> the point that I'm trying to make today is that you know, the schemes run by groups like Asha, which has been so successful that they're expanding it, 
that you know, these schemes are not going to offer, uh, offer a silver bullet, and I'm not here to offer you a silver bullet either. Friends, I'm not here today to say to you, this is how we can deal with this problem, but this is India's greatest challenge. I can't even give you an inspiring message. All I can say to you is that unless we deal with this situation, India is rapidly approaching its darkest hour. In all the research that I've done, there's only one conclusion that I can come to, which is that education is not enough. It has to, be, it has to lead on to jobs. It has to mean that women, even if they're not educated, are financially empowered, financially independent. If we can make that happen, and if we can give girls like Geetha some, some level of confidence and get them into jobs, then we can try and turn the situation around. Thank you.